before the investigation is over, more bodies will be found, and even a community used to violence will be shaken by a serial killer on the loose. It was obvious that these women didn't die of natural causes. It just wasn't clear in the beginning what the connection was between them. Along with police, there are those who chronicle the investigation up close, on film, on paper, and on tape. They are the public's first witness. Through their lens, they capture our darkest chapters of crime. In Northern California, the state capital of Sacramento is experiencing a period of growth and prosperity. It was expanding. More people were coming to live here. Um, different neighborhoods were developing. I think anybody who moved here absolutely would love it and will want to live here. It's definitely a place that you can raise kids, raise a family, and retire. There are some areas of the city that even long-time residents try to avoid. One is Oak Park on Sacramento's southeast side, the city's oldest suburb. It didn't pay to go into Oak Park by yourself, because you never know what's going to happen. It was just a plain mean area. And they had lots of problems with um, drugs and street prostitution. There were all the crimes involving drinking and drugs, lots of fights. At the time, the drug fueling much of that violence is taking the city by storm. Rock cocaine, uh, or commonly known as crack, uh, that was something that was now starting to take its place in the uh, Sacramento drug area. And uh, we were finding lots of people using it, uh, being that it was extremely uh, addictive. I think Oak Park probably in the 1980s was at its highest peak as far as... Uh, drug usage. For many drug users in Oak Park, fueling their $400 a day habit is a full-time job. 22-year-old Yolanda Johnson is one of those people. But it wasn't always that way. I understand that she was a very, very good cosmetologist. She did hair. But once she got into the crack cocaine scene, she never returned. Her thing was to, you know, steal the, anything that didn't belong to her, to barter off, to sell off, to get a drug. Known in the neighborhood as Yo-Yo, Johnson works as a prostitute, cruising the local strip to finance her next high. It is a job with its own set of occupational hazards. She was just one of those uh, individuals that was working in a type of uh, a job that, uh, you know, you were very susceptible to being victimized in whatever manner. You know, either rape, uh, beatings, drug rip-offs. Sometimes working girls in the neighborhood simply disappear, and Yolanda knows a few who have been missing for several months. But Yolanda also knows from experience that women in this profession come and go, often without warning. The thing about when these people came up missing who were on drugs or prostitutes, they would leave home and be gone three or four months at a time and then they'd come back stay around three or four months then leave and come back another hazard of the job is the police on june 9th 1986 yolanda is arrested for soliciting she is back on the streets a few days later and on june 15th she gets into an argument with another prostitute pamela sooks and i think pamela Sook might have been one of the last persons who saw yolanda johnson alive June 18th, 1986. At 8 o'clock in the morning, a truck pulls up in front of a vacant house in the Sacramento suburb of Oak Park. This person was going to finish up some last minute details because I believe the owner was coming in the next day to make sure the house was done. So he went into the house and he smelled a foul odor. He knew that it was something wrong because he had been in Vietnam before and he knew 
a bad smell, or definitely smell when you did, but he never really paid any attention to it. Figuring it's probably a dead animal, the workman goes outside to collect the carpeting he plans to install that morning. So he went back up to the house, and that smell hit him in the face again. So this time he wants to check out the whole house. So he goes through all, all the rooms in the house. When he gets to the last room, he opens the door and walks in, and then he sees a dead body in the closet. So he called police to report it and uh, homicide detectives responded out there. When Sacramento homicide detectives arrive at the address, they recognize it as a house frequented by drug addicts and prostitutes. At night, the house would be pretty much turned into a trick pad, a place where you would go, have, where you would go and do drugs. Inside a bedroom closet, police find the decomposing body of a woman, naked from the waist down. They also find drug paraphernalia used to smoke crack cocaine. There was nothing inside of the residence, so you really couldn't say that any furniture was thrown about or there was any fighting going on. But uh, it was evident that uh, there was some sexual activity uh, that had uh, taken place there. There was what appeared to be um, semen found on one of her legs. And uh, at that time, DNA was in its infancy as far as uh, being able to find out immediately um, who the DNA, DNA may be connected to. But to me, that was probably uh, the most uh, critical piece of evidence on the scene. In 1986, the science behind DNA is relatively new and still cumbersome. The sample must be sent to a federal crime lab where results are anything but immediate. Sometimes it would take two or three years. Yeah, it was, there was a backlog. The only other clues are three fingerprints, but they turn out to be those of the workman who discovered the body. The man, who identifies himself as 42-year-old Carl Patilla, tells police that he has been doing renovations on the house for about a month, but has not been there for several days. Carl is interviewed by media at the scene, but the story is far from front-page news. It wasn't one of those crimes that got a lot of public attention or outrage because they were prostitutes and drug addicts and they lived in a, a bad part of town I mean, it wasn't a real concern that same day the coroner's office puts a name to the body it is 22 year old Yolanda Johnson who disappeared three days earlier the following month however another crime scene will be discovered in Oak Park and this time the incident won't seem quite so isolated. June 18th, 1986. In the Sacramento suburb of Oak Park, the body of a woman has been identified as 22-year-old Yolanda Johnson, a known prostitute and drug addict. Cause of death has not been confirmed, but it is clear that police are dealing with a homicide. Detectives have already questioned Carl Patilla, the 42-year-old handyman who discovered the body at the vacant house where he was doing renovations. There is little he can tell them beyond what he found that morning. Although he lives and works in the Oak Park area, he has never seen the victim before and has not been at the house for several days. However, later that day, a routine fingerprint check makes it clear that while he is a handyman and has been doing renovation work in and around Oak Park for more than two years, Carl Patilla is not who he says he is. He was using his brother's name, so he wasn't really Carl Patilla. He was some individual, another individual. So they checked him out. The police checked him out. His real name is Morris Solomon Jr and police discover that he has a criminal record dating back to 1969. Convicted of sexual assault in 1971, he is classified as a mentally disordered sex offender and sent to a facility for two years of treatment. Following his release, Solomon is acquitted in the 1974 murder of a California masseuse after a key witness fails to show up for the trial. In 1977, he is sentenced to two years to life in San Quentin for the sexual assault and rape of a prostitute. Since his parole in 1980, there have been no further convictions. 
On the evening of June 18th, 1986, detectives bring Solomon back in for questioning. The handyman admits that he lied about his identity because he has several outstanding warrants and was afraid he would be arrested. Most are for traffic misdemeanors, but one is for soliciting prostitution. When confronted with a photograph of the victim, Solomon now acknowledges that he knows her to be local prostitute Yolanda Yo-Yo Johnson. He admits to using her services six months earlier, and that at the time, she ripped him off for $20. He denies any further sexual contact with her, and is adamant that he has not seen her for more than a week. Through it all, Solomon is completely cooperative, admitting that he made a mistake trying to hide his identity and eager to help in any way he can. He just seemed like a very average person. Um, and when you talk to him, you know, he, he was a very polite person. And so when you saw him, you just took it as, well, he just maybe did stumble upon the body and found him, you know, because he isn't acting suspicious in any way. Although his past makes Solomon a prime suspect, there is no hard evidence that ties him to Yolanda Johnson's death. There is also the question of why he would contact police in the first place if he is responsible. Without more evidence, the DA's office is unwilling to prosecute, and since the handyman's existing warrants are for misdemeanors only, Sacramento police decide to let him go. Although they are unable to detain him, they do intend to find out more about Morris Solomon Jr. In Oak Park, they discover a man well-liked in the community. Morris could uh, repair anything. And that's why he was so successful finding work. Because people were renovating houses. He was reliable, as some of the people had told us. Uh, and they could count on him. For this reason, his employers often allow Solomon to live in the houses that he renovates, moving from place to place as he moves from job to job. Detectives also talk to those who have worked with Solomon since his arrival in Oak Park, but in a very different capacity. Prostitutes in the neighborhood who knew Yolanda Johnson also know Morris Solomon very well. They thought he was basically a generous person. He would even date women. And if he didn't have the money, you know, they'd have sex with him on credit. The next couple of days when he got that money, Morris went there to pay to him. So yeah, he definitely had a, he's had a good heart. By July 15th, almost a month after the discovery of Yolanda Johnson's body, Sacramento detectives are no closer to solving her murder. There is every indication that Morris Solomon Jr. had nothing to do with her death, and there are no further suspects. That same day, 24-year-old Angela Polidore is released from police custody after spending four days in jail on prostitution charges. Angela Polidore lived in Oak Park. She was absolutely a knockout, drop-dead gorgeous female. She is one person who was known in the neighborhood who would chase crack cocaine 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days a year. That was her thing. Whatever she could do to get that drug, she would do. And that's including having sex, selling the body. In the early morning hours of July 16th, 1986, Angela Polidore finds someone who is willing to provide her with the drug she craves. She brings him to the home of a friend, Janice Scott. This particular person used to let her bring Johns over to her house to have sex in the laundry room or something like that. But her uh, friend was like, look, hey, it's too late. <laughs> you gotta go. So, well, the answer said, well, can I sit here and smoke this vial of uh, crack cocaine? She said, yes, hurry up, make it quick. So they went in the bathroom to smoke this crack cocaine. And that was the last time they saw her. But they had mentioned that they thought she had left in a pickup truck. July 20th, 1986. 